Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My Angular Story. This week, we're talking to Victor Savkin. Victor, do you want to say hello? Hey, hello, everyone. Now, uh, we've had you on Adventures in Angular a few times, and I think you're uh, fairly well known in the community for being on the core team and then uh, being one of the guys that started Narwhal. All right. Yep. Uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit about my, myself. So I think most folks know me because I was on the Angular core team. So I was at Google right, for, for a long time, uh, working on all of key parts of Angular, including the route or change detection forms, things like that. And uh, a few folks know me because I blog a lot. So I used to blog at thisafkin.com, and these days I blog at uh, blog.narrow.io. So I create a lot of, I think, good quality Angular content, so people tend to like it. And yes, uh, Jeff Cross, who was also on the Angular team, and I left Google some time ago to start our company called Narrow. Awesome. And uh, for people who want to go back and listen to you, man, we haven't had you on the show for a while. We're going to have to fix uh-huh. that. <laughs> um, we had you on episode 42 talking about dependency injection and change detection. Uh-huh. Um, and then we also had you on episode 123 talking about upgrading from Angular to Ang- or Angular JS to Angular. Of course, mm-hmm. that episode says Angular one to Angular two. Right. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. That's true. So yeah, we'll have to get you back on the show and uh, talk about something else, maybe. And yeah, I'm happy to be on the show. Happy to join you guys. Awesome. Now this episode is more kind of to capture your story. Mm-hmm. figure out what you're about, who you are, where you came from, all that good stuff. Sure. Um, the thing is, is that I find that pe- find people, they either kind of get to know people as personalities at conferences or they, you know, they kind of see your name on a blog post or a, a Git commit or something, but they don't actually know who the people are behind it. Right. Kind of what I'm yeah. to here. So let's, let's roll way back to when you got into programming. How did you get into programming? Oh boy, it was a... Uh... A long time ago, I was still in Russia, so I grew up in Russia, and I, uh, as many programmers, I got into gaming. So, uh, like, I like you know playing games, and once you start playing games, you're like, I can build my own game, right? And I was also into board games, so like, I, I know board games, I kind of sort of like computer games. Let me try to build my own computer game, and I think I was 12 or 13, so I was like a teenager. So I started by building games in uh, Flash. Because it's easy to do it, like flash. I think it's flash. Right? Uh-huh. So it was, uh, it was cool. I, I was doing that for a few years, and uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Then I sort of pivoted and decided to do more math. Uh, I was like, okay, math is what I want to do. Did math for a few years, and I liked it. But then it's hard to make money by doing. That. Like you need to be very lucky uh, to right. make a living if you're a mathematician. So I switched back to programming. That makes sense. So what was it, uh, you know, about programming? Because I know f- a few people, they got into games, right? right? They start playing games and they're like, oh, I could I could totally build this or I want to learn to program to do this. And then they figure out that's hard. All right. Programming is very hard. That's true. Yeah. So so why didn't you quit? <laughs> uh, I, in lots of reasons. I think in general, uh, programming can be fun. It is very hard. But hard mm-hmm. doesn't mean it is not enjoyable. Right. A lot of hard things are enjoyable. For example, being single is easier than being with someone, right? Uh, but I think being with someone, uh, yeah, yeah, you need to worry about fewer things, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's more enjoyable, at least to me personally, being in a relationship, right? Yeah. Uh, so similarly, uh, programming is hard. It is frustrating, kind of irritating. These days, it's slightly better because you can Google for things, right? Back in the day, it was harder because like Googling for things didn't really work. So you had to like go through books, find something that's relevant enough to maybe address your issue, you know? 
uh, which I think was actually a good experience because back in the day you had to read through a lot of source code to see what the hell is going on because it was hard to find information elsewhere, right? Uh -huh. So it forced you to just go and read through libraries like the source code, the source code with many libraries to see why it doesn't work or to figure out how it works, which I think is a useful skill even today. And I think fewer folks uh, do it. And uh, it can be enjoyable because you have this uh, so the discovery process when you're trying to make it work, you know, you have this small release of dopamine every time you sort of figure it out, move mm -hmm. forward just a little bit, right, closer to what you want. And uh, it's also like a creative process, which is enjoyable as well, right? So you feel like you have an idea in mind, you explore it, you can draw on a piece of paper, you can try and implement it in one way, the other way. So the creative aspect of it is, uh, is cool as well. Uh, for me, it's mostly the, the state of flow, right? If you go to the state of flow and you have this, let me do it a little bit, you figure it out, like it works, you feel happy. Then for now, you feel unhappy because shit is not working. Then like, okay, I feel happy again, right? Yep. And uh, it, it's a, a, an interesting experience, frustrating, but at the same time, like enjoyable and sort of in, in its own life. Right. So how do you go from uh, writing games in Flash to doing Angular? Oh, yeah. So uh, I was uh, writing games in Flash. Then I write, was writing games in other things, you know. Uh -huh. uh, and then after I, I graduated, I went in the company to do a lot of uh, backend stuff. So for the longest time, I was doing sort of middleware, uh, Java middleware. It was my sort of area of expertise. And I was working on a lot of, uh, actually, the, the company was sort of like a Russian eBay sort of company. Okay. And uh, the first two projects I built for them was uh, an ad service, so to show, to show ads, right? And okay. the second one was search. Uh, which is kind of funny because I ended up working for Google, right? Where like search and ads is what they're known for, right? Anyway, so I was doing a lot of Java middleware and hated front end, like really hated it so much. Right? Every time I had to go to, the front, <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ, look at this! Uh, the tooling is so behind; it's just so painful to use, and I like really disliked it for a long time. And then I uh, went to another company already here in, in Canada, and I uh, I was working on the, uh, the Rails backend, Ruby on Rails backend. Uh -huh. I did all of Ruby Rails, and uh, they sort of have to touch front end more. It's on middleware. You're actually building a web app, like right? so. Once in a while, I have to go and write all the JavaScript, right? And uh, I hate it again for like the first year. Like this is just crazy, right? Look how bad it is. Uh, but then over time, I switched to uh, like uh, Backbone. Like oh, actually, a little more structure. It doesn't feel that bad. I actually, uh -huh. like find it more enjoyable. And then uh, tried a few other things, and then we ended up using Angular, and. Uh, it felt a lot better because I, I felt like it supported me a lot more. So I felt like I, I can think about architecture of the front end piece without worrying too much about, okay, I added a listener, I removed the listener, right? Uh, worrying too much about those small details that I don't want to worry about when I right. work on my app, right? So the little, the, sort of the abstraction that, that the AngularJS framework created was, was useful and uh, made me the back end person you know, at heart like the front end, especially now when more and more stuff moves to the front end. I do most of my work right now is Angular work, right? Or right. The, what you would call front end work, right? Uh -huh. But I still prefer working on the back end, the back end part of the front end work rather than building UI elements, right? Mm -hmm. I still like managing state, sort of dealing with architecture related issues, figuring out how to express data flow or like business logic. So I still a back end person in, like deep inside, right? It's right. just a lot of the stuff I used to do in Java, with Ruby on Rails, or PHP, or, or whatnot, right? Shifted, and now I do it in, in Angular, in TypeScript. That's cool. So it, it's, interest, it's interesting just seeing how far a lot of that stuff has come, right? You're talking yep. about data flow and business logic and things like that. And in, in what ways do you feel that that's gotten better over the last years? I, I think it got more... I, on one side, if you sort of compare it naively, I think it may seem that it got worse. Right, because you look at it I'm like I remember it being very simple, right? I could put a script yeah. back and just like boom, it works, right? And now I have to deal with this tool chain, the build system, the bundler, mm -hmm. minify, a lot of other things that I need to worry about. Uh, the compiled language like TypeScript right? before I actually before I'm able to run anything, right? Right. And uh, I think it's sort of a I don't like this way of looking at it because you still have the old option. It didn't go away. Mm -hmm. It's not like you cannot put a script back on the page. Like that, it's still there, right? If right. it actually satisfies your needs, right? If you're building the most simple app in the world with like three buttons being interactive, right? That's great, right? You can still mm -hmm. do it the old way it work just fine. Uh, I think once you, the complexity increases, if you look at some, some of the front-end apps, uh, at least I'm looking at uh, these days, some of them are one, two million lines of code. 
of JavaScript or TypeScript, right? Yeah. That's a lot of code. Like yeah. just even trying to imagine dealing with it in the, in the old way is like it's almost unthinkable. Because I remember when I was dealing with sort of the old way of writing it, even with AngularJS when we started, we didn't really bundle anything. It was very naive, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the app I was working on at that point was a lot smaller, the front end piece of it, right? Right. Were like 20, 30,000 lines of JavaScript. And it was very difficult to manage, like almost impossible to find what the hell is going on when things go wrong, right? And now, because of all this tooling, and particularly because of TypeScript, right? That's a big deal. Or the new version of Angular, again, it's a lot more toolable. I can open a one million line project and being able to figure out what's going on a lot easier uh, than I used to do it with like a, a much smaller project, right? So I think that when the scale go, when you look at it at scale for larger apps, you're actually able to deal with larger apps these days. And I think it was like unthinkable like 10 years ago. Yeah, usually what we, we would wind up with. So I, when I got into programming, I was doing Rails. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we were dealing with what David Heinemeyer Hansen, who's a creator of Rails, called yeah. JavaScript sprinkles. And essentially, yep. it was just a little here and a little there and a little here and a little there. But yeah, I mean, we built uh, the last full-time job I had, we were building a, a crime reporting application. And it had all this front end stuff to it. And it was all in Flash. All right. But yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine trying to do all that with JavaScript sprinkles all or right. trying to make jQuery talk to jQuery and play nicely with jQuery. Yep. You know, yep. It, it's jQuery was awesome for a handful of components or a handful of uh, elements on your page, right. uh, you know, that it, that it had to manage. But yeah, if it started managing something that another piece of jQuery was managing, it'd get complicated really quick. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, keep going. But but yeah, you know, I I remember finding Backbone and going, man, this is this is the stuff because yeah, it just kept it all organized. Yep. yep. And then uh, yeah, moving yeah. into Ember and then Angular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. So it's it's it. There are more pieces to think about, right, uh, or to worry about. Uh, but sometimes you need more pieces to worry about stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, for example, a lot of folks still focus when they look at the front end, they think that the, like, the UI element is what is the hardest thing to build, right? Like that, yep. the flashy table is what is, and it is true, it's very difficult to build that, right? But for most application developers, you use a table that someone already built, right? You like uh -huh. take a material table or like a material sort of component period, right? And you right. can sort of like 80% of the UI stuff is like the pure UI stuff. Mm -hmm. It's taken care of by someone else, right? And it's yes. good, right? It should be this way, right? Yeah, so, and it's really convenient that way. Right. Yep, exactly. I, I don't want to know the nuts and bolts. I just want the element on my yep, page. Yeah, exactly. So uh, especially if you go with like accessibility and stuff, it's very hard to get it right. right? So someone got it right, it's great. Right? So most of the things that you actually deal with when you're building a modern, like a large front-end app, especially if it's like a, like a, an enterprise app where you have to like, it's a lot of code, right? Uh -huh. It's not building a, a particular animation or an interesting button, but rather... I have this like a lot of code that I need to, which you cannot avoid because there's a lot of business requirements I need to implement. Right? There are a lot of different right. teams, different departments in this organization uh, using this app, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most of what you do is try to figure out how do I structure my code so I can understand what the hell is going on, right? How do I manage my state? So I, so the, when I look at the app, it shows me a consistent set of data. Right. Uh, how do I reuse what other folks built? So it's not really that UI-centric. That's why you need to worry more about architecture uh, I mean, architecture is sort of like a dirty word because people imagine that someone is architecture somewhere with a piece of paper <laughs> or whatever. But basically, you need to worry about high-level picture a lot more than right. you used to, right? Yep. And as a result, yes, it is more complex because there are more pieces that you need to worry about, but it's only because the problem got so much more complex. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, you've, I think you've put that really well. And a lot of times, it's really hard to just kind of get your head around why, you know, why does this feel so much harder? And yeah, it's because we're solving more complicated problems. Right. There's no way we could have built some of the applications we had out there yep. and, and really done it well without the yep. tools we have today. Yeah, I, I, especially when I look at some apps uh, that are like a, a beautifully built web apps, let's say Trello. Mm -hmm. Trello is a beautifully built web app, right? Yep. It, works in a, like, it works like a desktop app. A few things could have been not better, but overall, it's a pleasant experience, right? Yep. And imagine what if I build something like that just with uh, the old, like what uh, DHH uh, recommends, right? Yep. It's exceptionally hard if possible. Right? Yep. It's exceptionally hard, right? So just the fact that we can have an app like Trello, right, running and we're able mm -hmm. to build and maintain those kind of apps yep. relatively easily, right? So like not like the 1% of the brightest, but all of us who, like, are able to just do that, right? 
uh, I think it's an achievement that a lot of folks sort of don't acknowledge yep. or don't realize. So true. So I'm, I'm a little curious. How did you wind up getting on the Angular core team? Yeah, that was an accident. I was uh, using <laughs> Angular. <laughs> I mean, as many things... Half uh, the questions I ask on this show. <laughs> right. Well, I wasn't aiming for that, but I kind of wound up there. Yeah, I mean, that's how life is, right? It's a lot of sort of... If you try very hard, at some point, you get lucky somewhere, right? That's right. sort of the way it is, right? And um, I was blogging a lot about AngularJS, and I was writing about Angular, like a lot of AngularJS, so I was an Angular uh, mm-hmm. professional, I would say, right? So I, I knew AngularJS quite well. And at the same time, I was blogging a lot about Dart. Uh, most folks who listen to this podcast may not know about Dart, uh, because Dart, uh, at some point, was going to become big, and now it became, and it's still there. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of technology. It just became a, a, a little bit more niche, right? It's yeah. sort of more Google-focused, right? Uh, some other companies use it, but not as much. Yeah, we did an interview with uh, Lars and... Casper? Casper, yeah. 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 Early days, JavaScript Jabber, and... Yeah, it was like, this is cool, and it's going to change the internet, and then people adopted something else. <laughs> yeah, but that's how it happens, right? Like, yeah. yeah, you look at it, yeah, it's, it's actually a beautiful design piece of technology, but mm-hmm. what can you do, right? Yep. Just to, like, that's not what happened, right? So I was in one of Dart, and the Google uh, Dart team approached me asking if I want to become their dev advocate. Basically, you know, writing examples in Dart, showing Dart, and because I was passionate about Dart. I'm like, yeah, it sounds pretty good, you know? Uh, Dart is fine. I would like to work for Google for a little bit. So it should be an interesting experience. So I went there, interviewed, was successful, great, they liked me. And um, at that point, some inter- like at that point, uh, like it, a lot of bureaucratic stuff comes into it. I wasn't a Canadian at that point, so I couldn't get a visa to the US very easily. So I had to apply through H1B, which mm-hmm. you know, takes forever and it's like very tricky to get. And uh, uh, the team was going through some rework, the Chrome team that, you know, ended up sort of consuming Dart. And uh, so it, it just didn't line up. The timelines didn't line up, right? It just like didn't work out. And uh, then the, uh, the guy who approached me said, he said, do you want to work for the Angular team? Because they, you know, have a petition too. They're not going through any rework. It should be easier uh, to just, you know, finalize right. everything. And I'm like, yeah, Angular is like, honestly, it's even better, right? Because it's actually what I used at work. So I felt a lot more... Mm-hmm like familiar with how it should be used properly, right? Like, that sounds great. And uh, they said they were interested, and they said they were interested because they confused me with another Victor. So there were two <laughs> Victors. <laughs> so uh, uh, Vic B, uh, Victor Bisher, who is still on the Angular team, uh, who uh, like joined after me, like a year after, he was very active in the Angular Dart community. I wasn't nearly as active. I was just doing uh-huh. plain Dart stuff. So they thought I'm that Victor. So they're like, well, yeah, bring him over or whatever. And then when I was already there, like, you couldn't backpedal, right? I'm like, okay, that's fine. He seems, he seems okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so it just because I was uh, Victor and there was another Victor who was uh, active in the community, I sort of, you know, got this chance to, to work on, uh, on Angular. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. You just, you had the right name, right? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> that is a coincidence, right? I'm, I'm pretty happy that it worked out this way because I really enjoyed my time on the Angular team. Yeah, I think it was like excellent. So I, I think I, I mean, I'm sure I would have a lot of fun on the Dart team as well. Right. Uh, but I, I feel like my impact wouldn't be the same. Right. Absolutely. So uh, what contributions do you feel like you've made on the Angular team? A couple. I, I started uh, right at the beginning when the, uh, the Angular team decided to uh, do Angular Dart and Angular 2. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of at the... And I, again, another lucky coincidence, because there was a, uh, a new guy on the team sort of not owning anything yet, right? right? And I'm like, what can I own? And I ended up owning a lot of early work, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of folks like Igor and Mishka were busy doing AngularJS 1 stuff, right? right. So uh, it was actually quite, uh, quite lucky f- uh, for me that I had a chance to work on so much new, cool Angular stuff mm-hmm. very early on. Because basically folks are busy, right, doing other things that uh, right. the production customers required. Right? And um, so I, uh, early on, I did a lot of work on Angular Dart, uh, which right now if, uh, you care about only if you are a Googler. If you're not a Googler, you probably don't even know that there is Angular Dart. And then I worked on uh, the early versions of DI, dependency injection, sort of some, some of the uh, thing outside of the, the, the core compiler, the forms, uh, the router, a few other things. Uh, change detection. So a lot of early versions of uh, the Angular framework were 
back then it was known as Angular 2, I uh, contributed to a lot, right? Since then, other things, you know, moved forward, you know, mm -hmm. the changes actually got rewritten like 10 times. So uh, I don't think there is a lot left from uh, my commits in there, right? Uh, but the forms and the router, I think, are the two pieces that are more or less in the same shape mm -hmm. from when I uh, stopped working on them. I'm, I'm curious, uh, now that you're writing Angular apps uh, on... Mm -hmm kind of a more full-time basis and, you know, doing the training right. yeah. NX does, uh, or sorry, Narwhal does. Um, I'm curious, how is it different writing the framework versus writing an app in the framework? Yeah, I mean, I I, I, feel, I, I think the Angular team is like, it's, it's a, a bunch of really bright people. Right? It's great. Very smart team. The smart group of people I was a part of. So that's great. Uh, the, uh, however, I think that it would, it would have been even better if we had a chance to work on more apps uh, while being on the team, uh, most of it is good because some good engineering practices are just good engineering practices. You sort of know right. that they should be like that. An example would be if you write an Angular app, the bootstrap phase of your app is separate from post bootstrap phase, right? Mm -hmm. And this is like, you can't stress enough how important that is for your li the life cycle of your app to be predictable. But it's exceptionally important, right? Like it's hard, like, and it's yeah. important in, in any system, not just in Angular, you can write a different framework, just as important. You can write a backend app in Java, just as important, right? So yeah. like those kind of things, the fundamentals, right, are done right. Some of the APIs, when I build it right now myself, I'm like, well, especially regarding the router would be an example, right? Uh, I'm like, those kind of like, the, the way I design guards and resorts, I would say, I'm not, I don't use them right now when I build apps, right? And I think partially because I, I didn't think about some of the real world use cases. Uh, we try to collect all those cases we could and you know, come up with a solution which is good enough, right? Uh, but I feel like if I actually had a chance to build a few apps, some of the APIs would have been slightly different. The fundamentals would be the same, right? If I look right. at the fundamentals of the round or the forms, I would say, yeah, I mean, I think the fundamentals are very good. The, the ergonomics sometimes uh, could have been a bit better, right? If I had more experience actually building yeah. apps. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's one of the things actually what, uh, why I'm lucky right now that I uh, can touch a lot of apps, look at a lot of source code, right? Because we work with a lot of clients, right? And I can see how it's been used, right? When you look at like 20 large projects, you can, mm -hmm. you have, you kind of develop a feel of what people tend to use. Even if you think the solution you have is a wonderful solution and everyone should use it. If folks don't use it, it doesn't matter, right? And, uh, so I can sort of, uh, the annex, the, our open source solution, right, on top of Angular CLI, the extension to the Angular CLI, we sort of smooth some of those things, right? We generate certain settings in exactly the way I think folks should use it. And they, like right. some of those things we will make nicer because we actually have a hands-on, uh, like a lot of hands-on experience right, that we didn't have before. Yep. So what made you and Jeff want to leave Google and go start Narwhal? Right. I mean, I, I wouldn't speak for Jeff, but for, uh, for, for me, there are a few things. The first one is uh, I, f I felt like I can provide more value doing uh, like helping the real, real companies uh, use it, right? Because uh, at some point, so I, so everyone wants to, I think every program, programmer wants to work on a, a tool or framework or a library. That's sort of, you know, you just, you just like it, right? It's, it's an enjoyable thing to do, right? right? So I was doing it for a few years and I, I sort of got saturated. I felt like, oh, that's, I mean, I tried it. It's good. I did a lot of, I, I made an impact. I was useful to the community. I, I did my best. I don't feel like I there is enough novelty for me, right? It somewhat feels uh, the same, right? And I don't think I'm providing the most value I can, right? I can go to a large company, spend like a large enterprise, spend, uh, I don't know, a few weeks working with them and actually help a lot of developers. Like mm -hmm. it might be a lot more productive than my tweaking a few things here and there. So uh, like just uh, the fact that you feel you're providing real value, it matters. That's one. The second, I think it was a good market opportunity. You know, a lot right. of companies started to use uh, Angular. It got stable, robust. Mm -hmm. It's actually a good platform for building large apps. Uh, it works really well. And uh, I felt like uh, very few folks have the expertise and the reach that we have, right? Jeff and I right. have. And now we hired a lot of really, really talented folks from the community. Most of the folks who work for us right now if you look at them, you will recognize them because they are like known in the community. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of expertise which allowed us to like to solve certain problems like in days where for like if you don't have that expertise, it's almost unthinkable, right? To, like you actually need to know exactly how every single piece works, right? right. Or if you don't know, call the person who knows, right? Mm -hmm. And get information from them, right? 
So that's the second market opportunity. I feel like I wanted to provide more value. And finally, I just wanted to kind of get tired working in California. California is great. I like California. Uh-huh. It's wonderful. Just I never felt like I really belong in California. Somehow it always felt a little bit off. So mm-hmm. uh, I had a strong desire to move back to Toronto, uh, where I'm right now, and I lived before I moved to California. So that was an important uh, thing for me as well. So if uh, Google stopped, like allowed remote work, like proper remote work, right? Uh, it would have been a hard decision to make, but because I got sort of, I really wanted to move back, and I'm like, okay, so I cannot be on the Angular team if I'm moving back, right? right? So it made the whole thing a lot easier for me to decide. That makes sense. Well, cool. So you mm-hmm. started Narwhal. Mm-hmm. What what kinds of things has Narwhal been contributing to the community? We've talked about NX. Are there other things? Right. Yeah, a, a, a few things. The main one, I guess, is I mean, in addition to just doing like. Like there are many ways to contribute to the community, right. right? One of them is like we go and we speak at conferences, you know, sponsor mm-hmm. events, you know, uh, write blog posts, all the things that you know a lot of companies do, right? We we still do it because we have a lot of expertise, but like to uh, to share, right? So we we do that. Uh, in terms of open source contributions, I still uh, contribute to to Angular, uh, to the router here and there, not as much as I used to, you know, but it happens. Mm-hmm. Because I want to be sort of on top of it to make sure that I understand how every single piece of the framework still works, right? Not uh-huh. to lose the expertise. Right. right. And uh, a few folks who work for us, Dan and Tor in particular, they contribute to a lot of Bazel stuff. So Bazel is this hot, uh, a relatively hot build system that you know uh, Google put out. And the Angular repo itself uses it, the NGRX repo, like a lot of projects in the Angular community sort of adopted Bazel. It works really well, especially if you have a large system you want to build. So for larger right. companies, it's a great choice. So both, both Tor and then are contributing to the Angular rules. The, so if you want to do Angular with Basel, right, you probably are going to end up using the work that Dan and Tor did. Uh, James, who is working for us, uh, he uh, is contributing to Prettier. And uh, he put out a library called Precise Commits, uh, which allows you to run Prettier or any other tool, but Prettier in particular, against lines that you change in your PR rather than reformatting the whole thing. Because, you know, if you're a large company and you have 2,000 line files, you cannot be reformatting those files right? Right. all the time, right? Uh, you need to uh, have a more uh, sort of a more advanced way of using the tool, right? Yeah, I like that. And uh, a few other things. I think Jason is contributing to uh, Angular Universal quite a bit. Aishigo is contributing to, she does a lot of training. She teaches a lot of folks about Angular and how to like write Angular apps. Uh-huh. So I think I think most of uh, and if I forget someone, it, uh, you know, just uh, basically I think all of us or almost all of us contribute to the community on a regular basis right. in lots of different ways, either by teaching folks, writing blog posts, or contributing to open source projects. Yeah, yeah, and and I think I think that's definitely true. And if you follow, like I follow a number of people that work for Narwhal, and right. yeah, they're they're always doing interesting things. Whether it's like you said, contributing to open source, or whether they're you know, the writing blog posts or speaking at conferences yep. or, you know, uh, Justin Schwarzenberger is... Oh, the, yeah, well, Justin, he's a... There. Exactly, yeah. He's a, a very, a very very nice guy who works for us and he does a lot of really good uh, work when he creates the good content. Angular is one example, yep. uh, but he also does... Uh, he did a few courses, video course on NX and like building enterprise Angular apps. But also really good. You should check them out. as well. Awesome. Are those on Egghead or Pluralsight or something? Uh, I think that we have our own, but basically they're on Teachable. We have our own oh, okay. like flavor of Teachable. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, all of that stuff, it just, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny because I hear a lot of people basically come in and they're like, well, you know, I just, I don't know how to contribute open source. I'm like, write blog posts, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Create so content. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I agree. I mean, contributing sometimes can be intimidating. So like, I, I, and uh, I, I try to, like, because I, right now, NX is our main open source sort of endeavor, our main project mm-hmm. we contribute to, which is an extension to the CLI optimized for large teams, basically for large enterprises. Yeah. And uh, so I, like, I go through issues and see what folks open, what PRs they open, and a lot of folks who contribute to open source are exceptionally busy, right? Because yeah. it's an extra thing you do, right? On top of doing your real work where you make money from, right? Yep. And uh, so you, uh, I allocate like an hour on Saturday or two hours on Saturday just to go through all the stuff and try to help folks, right? And yep. it requires a certain, not an attitude, but it's a lot of effort to actually say, I will actually try to be helpful to folks, right? I see a person is trying to contribute and uh, 
it's easy for me just to close the issue and say, sorry, not going to happen or whatever, right? Uh, but like it, it's because like you have a lot of things to take to to take care of, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of effort to just say like, let me try to help the person. Then like to help the person to contribute the first time, and the second time the person will contribute with ease, right? It's usually the first couple of times where it's hard. So when you see uh, as a contributor, you, you try to contribute to a project, right? And the uh -huh. the owner of the project is not responsive, or maybe seems a little bit uh, brief in there. Like I think most of the time the owner of the project or the maintainer wants to help you it's just the person might be overwhelmed right so so I, like I, I get how easy it is to get discouraged as a contributor when you send a pr somewhere you don't get any response for a month right right and uh, chances are the person on that side is like working nights right to uh to to make sure other things are in order right so uh just try to be nicer to each other more sort of understanding of uh how of both the both sides of the, of the story yep Absolutely. So what are you working on now? A couple of things. I mean, apart from the client work, we actually help uh, like a lot of uh, clients be successful with Angular. The main open source thing I'm working on is NX. That's my main sort of uh, interest right now. So we recently moved NX from CLI 1.X to CLI 6. And if you, mm -hmm. if you know a little bit about Angular CLI, it has changed a lot, right? <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh, like quite a bit. And uh, uh, so that we talked to the CLI team many, many times. Mm -hmm. You know, to share some information about what we do to make sure that, you know, it is easier for us to build an accent of the CLI and they know what we do so we don't clash, you know, stuff like that, right? So the CLI team actually was very helpful to make sure we uh, we are productive, right, that we are unblocked. So big thanks uh, to them. So we moved to CLI 6. That was a, a big effort. It took a few weeks of hard work. And now we're sort of, uh, because the CLI 6 is so much more robust, because it gives you a capability to run custom commands against your projects, right? Uh, we can now implement a lot more advanced scenarios, you know, for, right. for large teams. For example, you have a, a workspace, like a monorepo with, like I say, 10 apps and 100 lips, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can now link things in parallel and only link the things that are affected by your change. So let's say you touched one of the apps or like one of the lips and only 10 lips in that workspace is affected, mm -hmm. uh, affected by your change, right? We can in parallel relink those lips very quickly and you run the tasks in parallel, only those tasks, right? Things like that. And we can also remember what failed last time so we know what to run first, right, to provide you the better dev experience, things like right. that, right? Thing that were not possible with CLI 1.x because it was a lot more constraining, now are possible and we're excited to sort of explore all different ways in which we can make uh, the dev experience of larger teams better. Mm -hmm. And most of it is sort of borrowing the dev experience from Google, right? Google does right. all those things kind of in a very clunky way, right? But some of the fundamentals, they, 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 they get right, right? Right. So uh, we're trying to... We cannot borrow the tools because the Google tooling is very internal and basically unborrowable, right? They just right. have it. Uh, but at least the experience of like, if I am to solve this problem, what would I do, right? Right. Uh, to try to build a similar experience with the Angular CLI. That's awesome. I, I really want to try out NX. I've just had a lot of things going on lately. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you have two. Didn't you just get married? Uh, no, I'm getting married. Uh, You're getting I, uh, married. Yeah, I'm actually, my, like, this year is crazy. So I'm getting married in, at the end of August, uh, which I'm excited about. And I'm looking for a house because, you know, like, it's basically like a crazy, crazy year. Overwhelmed by, uh, by exciting things at work, but also exciting things in my personal life. Oh, good. Anything else you want to talk about there? Or? Uh, my personal life? Uh, no, it's just, uh, it, uh, I think it's going really well. Uh, I don't know. Pretty happy. Good to hear. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, congratulations on your uh, impending marriage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've been married for 13 and a half years, and I'm pretty happy with the, yeah. the outcome so far. So <laughs> hopefully it works out as well for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope, so. I hope so too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, let's go ahead and do some picks then. Do you have some things you want to shout out about? This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the hosting provider I use for devchat.tv. I also use it for my applications that manage the RSS feeds, scheduling, and sponsorships involved in delivering these shows. DigitalOcean is easy to use, has data centers all over the world, and provides terrific services including server hosting and object storage for delivering your web applications and assets quickly and easily. I use DigitalOcean because I love their interface. I get SSD storage for my servers, and their support replies quickly. So go check them out at DigitalOcean.com. Sure, I can I can share a few things. I tend to share like sort of book picks, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, one book pick I wanted to share. So I'm uh, at some point I really got into 
stoicism as my main like philosophy i put it in quotes because like uh you can treat as real philosophy or more or you can treat this more like a self-help kind of way like just a way of life and uh a lot of folks read about stoicism in the self-help kind of way of life so they right. read something by ryan holiday and it's good i mean mm-hmm. it's still useful stuff if it helps you that's wonderful and i read all of this stuff as well but I also have this very academic mindset, being a mathematician before, so like, I need to be very structured. So I need to know exactly how it's structured. So I read the book called The Stoic Life, which is an actual, like an academic book, uh-huh. right? So you read it not for the uh, embrace stoicism for your personal life, but more like, what exactly did they mean when they write that stuff, right? And it goes into the sections of stoicism that uh, I find interesting. For example, uh, the stoic epistemology, how exactly did they perceive the world, right? Things like right. that. So I found it very interesting. It's probably one of the best nonfiction books I've read in, in a while. It's called The Stoic Life, so you should check it out. What else? Uh, I had a lot of problems with my uh, wrist pain. So I, I program a lot, and at some point, I just couldn't move my hand, right? It was that. Right. Right. So uh, I recommend if you have this problem, A, go see a specialist, right? Don't, <laughs> that's the first thing you need to do, right? Don't start stretching things by yourself. See a specialist. After that, right, you can buy some special equipment. I got a track, a track ball by uh, Logitech, and the track ball works really well. It, it's angled, so my hand essentially, essentially rests on a track ball in a very natural way. I don't move my hand very much because it's a track ball, right? So you move your thumb. And uh, a lot of my pain went away in like, like two weeks just mm-hmm. by switching to the track ball. So if you have a lot of wrist pain, explore track balls. Yep. I also just want to reemphasize, yeah, go talk to a doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't try to do it. A lot of folks like, I will just spend a thousand dollars buying the best ergonomical. No, no, no. Go to a doctor. You know, yeah. maybe you can just do like a, an exercise, like a five minutes a day and boom, right? In a few weeks, you might feel a lot better, right? So yep. always go to your doctor first and then buy equipment. Don't buy a lot of equipment and then like, because people tend to look, especially engineers, you're like, Right. If I buy this five hundred dollar mouse, right? Somehow, all my pain will go away. Like, just, yeah, uh, it's not the case. Or you can go do a one hundred dollar doctor appointment. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the thing that gets right. me. They spend all this time and effort researching it. Right. And it's like, just just go talk to the doctor. Yeah, and, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, I know a few people that have solved issues like that essentially by uh, changing their setup in some way, and it's usually uh, a different shaped keyboard or. Right. a you know, a trackball, or um, I've also seen the my the mouse that vertical fits, mice, yeah, yeah, the vertical mice, yeah, and and I had some people tell me that that helped them. So yeah, you know, the trackball, same deal, right? Yep. But yeah, um, and your doctor may not be an expert in that particular area of things, but they can give you some general ideas, and you can ask them about that when you go. Yep. I'm going to jump in with a few books as well. Then, if you're doing mm-hmm. book picks, so. I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks lately. I think the one that's really kind of got me thinking still, I listened to it about a week week or two ago, and I've still been thinking through it. It's The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And he talks about essentially your uh, self-limiting beliefs. And so it's, you, you kind of have this, everybody, I guess, has this thermostat or this sense of how well things should be able to go. And we tend to, in ways that we don't even recognize, sometimes wind up self-sabotaging. So one area of life starts getting really, really good, and we have this feeling that things should only get so good. And so, you know, we start having headaches or getting sick or, you know, we start, you know, other things in our life start going poorly because we're not maintaining those things. And I think there's some balance that happens just naturally because, you know, if I'm spending all of my time on my career, then my family relationships are going to suffer a little bit. And that's just a function of how much time I spend. But at the same time, you know, a lot of this was why can't, you know, and, and I've really been thinking, yeah, why shouldn't I be able to have a great career and a great business and a great family life? And, you know, and so a lot of things I feel like I've kind of been moving past whatever my limit was before. Mm-hmm. And, Anyway, that, that's been really interesting. There was another book I read a long time ago. I'm trying to remember which one it was. But they talked about basically your financial thermostat. And so, you know, you set your thermostat to a million dollars. And then, you know, pretty soon you're finding ways to make that million dollars. And it was, it was just interesting because it, it felt like the same principle, right? It's mm-hmm. 
what do I believe I'm capable of? And then mm-hmm. what do I believe it's going to take to get there? And anyway, I, I really, really enjoyed the book. I thought it was very, oh, cool. um, very interesting. Um, another one that I've been reading, and it's funny because this is a book about raising kids, but psychologically, I'm like, I do that. Like I read the book and I'm like, <laughs> I have this problem, right? Um, it's, it's called The Whole Brain Child, and it's by uh, Daniel J. Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. And yeah, it talks about, you know, t- uh, strategies and techniques for helping your kids essentially connect their right brain and their left brain and then kind of their higher modality and their lower modality. So, you know, a lot of times you're, you're, you're frustrated and that's the, you know, that's a right brain emotional kind of thing. And so it's figuring out how to articulate it and connecting that where you're at to the left brain. And, and so it talks you through how to talk to your kids and react to your kids and, and work through that. But there were a few times where I'm sitting there going, Oh man, I do that. And I need, you know, and so I've, I've found myself kind of working my way through some of these issues in the same way that they tell you to work with your kids. So maybe I'm just a two year old at heart. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, those were, have been two really mm-hmm. excellent books, both with, with regards to my life and my family and also with regards to just me and, and being a person. And mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes we get caught up in, the areas of life that revolve around the technology and things like that. Cause it's, it's easy, right? It works, it works or it doesn't, it works a certain way or another way, you know, but, but there are only so many options you really have. And in life it gets complicated because there's so many different facets to it. Right. And so, um, but, but I think we all need to take a few minutes to be people. And I guess that's my last pick and maybe I'll get a little bit personal here, but so last week I was dealing with just some mild depression. I don't, like, I don't know what deep clinical depression is. And, you know, I've, I've kind of been trying to psychoanalyze myself. And I, I think I've come to some conclusions about things. A, a lot of this precipitated from my dad passing away about a month and a half ago. And, you know, just, just figuring out, okay, because I, I, I guess I had this worldview. And I, I don't know that I articulated it. And I still think that it's partially true. But, you know, if you do all the, you know, all the right things, then everything will just go the way that it's supposed to is kind of the way that I was working through things. And then my dad died and it was kind of in a way that was unexpected and not in the way that I felt like things should have gone. And so then it's okay, well, then does everything go the way that it's supposed to? And I still think that that's, like I said, partially true, but I think it's empowered me in a lot of ways to also just come to the realization that I've got to work for it if I really want it. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so it was just, you know, having those shifts in in life are going to, you know, take a minute to be human through mm-hmm. those, right? Because it's never going to be 100% what you think. So anyway, sorry to go deep on that. But one last thing, if people want to find you online, where do they go, Victor? They can go to uh, blog.narrow.io. This is mm-hmm. the place where I blog these days most of the time. Uh, they can also go to Twitter slash uh, Victor Sakin. So they'll find me there. I usually tweet about Angular stuff. Very rarely I tweet about just some random stuff, but it's usually tech related, some sort of keyboard, some sort of, you know, tech related stuff. Nice. Yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. And I'm assuming most of your work is going to show up under the Narwhal organization on GitHub. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you go to, uh, actually check out narwhal.io. So you will see, uh, you know, uh, the team, the excellent team, we managed to assemble uh, what we work on, you know, who we are. Maybe you'll get excited and we'll, you know, approach us. You said the team and assemble and my brain went to Avengers Assemble. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, don't, I think it's Brendan or someone on the Angular community called us the Angular Avengers because I mean, we mm-hmm. were just like getting a lot of uh, like really well-known folks, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you can think of us as if you are a Marvel person, right? Think of us as the Angular Avengers. Right? Now, which Avenger are you then? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm a sort of a troubled, probably... I mean, I would be probably Tony Stark because I like how troubled he is. Uh-huh. He's like always like, oh, life is still, like he's, you know, issues with depression, you know, he was issues, he had issues with alcohol. Like I can sort of, I like the complexity of that character. Yeah. That's all the other characters I think uh, sort of lack. So Tony Stark would be the one I would like to be, but yeah, I don't, know. I don't really have a very strong preference. I've That's seen good. the last movie though. It was pretty good. Yeah, yeah it was like, good. Yeah. All right, good deal. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks for coming and talking to us for the last hour or so. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Yeah, we'll uh, wrap this up and we'll catch everybody next week.
Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more. 